Chapter One of Science of Being Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. Science of Being Well by Wallace D. Waddles. Chapter One The Principle of Health. In the personal application of the science of being well, as in that of the science of getting rich, certain fundamental truths must be known in the beginning and accepted without question. Some of these truths we state here. The perfectly natural performance of function constitutes health, and the perfectly natural performance of function results from the natural action of the principle of life. There is a principle of life in the universe. It is the one living substance from which all things are made. This living substance permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. It is in and through all things, like a very refined, indefusible ether. All life comes from it. Its life is all the life there is. Man is a form of this living substance and has within him a principle of health. The word principle is used as meaning source. The principle of health in man, when in full constructive activity, causes all the voluntary functions of his life to be perfectly performed. It is the principle of health in man which really works all healing, no matter what system or remedy is employed and this principle of health is brought into constructive activity by thinking in a certain way. I proceed now to prove this last statement. We all know that cures are wrought by all the different and often opposite methods employed in the various branches of the healing art. The allopath who gives a strong dose of a counterpoison cures his patient, and the homeopath who gives a diminutive dose of the poison most similar to that of the disease, also cures it. If allopathy ever cured any given disease, it is certain that homeopathy never cured that disease, and if homeopathy ever cured an ailment, allopathy could not possibly cure that ailment. The two systems are radically opposite in theory and practice, and yet both cure most diseases. And even the remedies used by physicians in any one school are not the same. Go with the case of indigestion to half a dozen doctors and compare their prescriptions. It is more than likely that none of the ingredients of any one of them will be in the others. Must we not conclude that their patients are healed by a principle of health within themselves and not by something in the varying remedies? Not only this, but we find the same ailments cured by the osteopath with manipulations of the spine, by the faith healer with prayer, by the food scientist with bills of fare, by the Christian scientist with the formulated creed statement, by the mental scientist with affirmation, and by the hygienist with differing plans of living. What conclusion can we come to in the face of all these facts but that there is a principle of health, which is the same in all people, and which really accomplishes all the cures, and that there is something in all the systems, which under favorable conditions arouses the principle of health to action, that is, medicines, manipulations, prayers, bills of fare, affirmations, and hygienic practices cure whenever they cause the principle of health to become active, and fail whenever they do not cause it to become active. Does not all this indicate that the results depend upon the way the patient thinks about the remedy, rather than upon the ingredients in the prescription? There is an old story which furnishes so good an illustration on this point that I will give it here. It is said that in the Middle Ages, the bones of a saint kept in one of the monasteries were working miracles of healing. On certain days, a great crowd of the afflicted gathered to touch the relics, and all who did so were healed. On the eve of one of those occasions, some sacrilegious rascal gained access to the case in which the wonder-working relics were kept and stole the bones and in the morning with the usual crowd of sufferers waiting at the gates, the fathers found themselves shorn of the source of the miracle-working power. 
they resolved to keep the matter quiet, hoping that by doing so they might find the thief and recover their treasures, and hastening to the cellar of the convent they dug up the bones of a murderer who had been buried there many years before. These they placed in the case, intending to make some plausible excuse for the failure of the saint to perform his usual miracles on that day, and then they led in the waiting assemblage of the sick and infirm. To the intense astonishment of those in the secret, the bones of the malefactor proved as efficacious as those of the saint, and the healing went on as before. One of the fathers is said to have left a history of the occurrence, in which he confessed that, in his judgment, the healing power had been in the people themselves all the time, and never in the bones at all. Whether the story is true or not, the conclusion applies to all the cures wrought by all the systems. The power that heals is in the patient himself, and whether it should become active or not does not depend upon the physical or mental means used, but upon the way the patient thinks about these means. There is a universal principle of life, as Jesus taught, a great spiritual healing power, and there is a principle of health in man which is related to this healing power. This is dormant or active according to the way a man thinks. He can always quicken it into activity by thinking in a certain way. Your getting well does not depend upon the adoption of some system or the findings of some remedy. People with your identical ailments have been healed by all systems and all remedies. It does not depend upon climate. Some people are well and others are sick in all climates. It does not depend upon avocation, unless in case of those who work under poisonous conditions. People are well in all trades and professions. Your getting well depends upon your beginning to think and act in a certain way. The way a man thinks about things is determined by what he believes about them. His thoughts are determined by his faith, and the results depend upon his making a personal application of his faith. If a man has faith in the efficacy of a medicine, and is able to apply that faith to himself, that medicine will certainly cause him to be cured. But though his faith be great, he will not be cured unless he applies it to himself. Many sick people have faith for others, but none for themselves. So, if he has faith in a system of diet, and can personally apply that faith, it will cure him. And if he has faith in prayers and affirmations, and personally applies his faith, prayers and affirmations will cure him. Faith, personally applied, cures, and no matter how great the faith or how persistent the thought, it will not cure without personal application. The science of being well, then, includes the two fields of thought and action. To be well, it is not enough that man should merely think in a certain way. He must apply his thought to himself, and he must express and externalize it in his outward life by acting in the same way that he thinks. End of chapter one. Recording by Jill Preston.